Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. What shall we render unto thee, O Lord, for all that he has given to us? Wisdom. Read St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. Let us attend. Brethren, be obedient to those who preside over you and submit yourselves to them, for they watch over your souls with vigilance, as those who will give an account, in order they may do this with joy and not with grief, and that would be unprofitable to you. Pray for us, for we are persuaded that we have a good conscience in all things willing to conduct ourselves honorably. So I exhort you to the more exceedingly to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the everlasting covenant, even our Lord Jesus, perfect you in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, who be the glory and through the ages of ages. Amen. Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, January 17th, is the commemoration of St. Anthony the Great, one of the leading lights of the monastic life in, in the church. And what I would like to do today is focus 
uh, mostly on some of the things that he said, his, his, his teaching, because I, he uh, is, is an example of dedication and devotion, persistence and patience and spiritual warfare, uh, and demonstrates how we are to draw near to, to Christ. And the things that he taught were things that he had learned the hard way. He was not particularly, uh, in the worldly sense, an educated person. Uh, it's not that he was uneducated. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But, but that his perception of education was really uh, that true wisdom and true knowledge comes from the experience of God. And it is direct experience that teaches us what it means to be good and virtuous and wise and to be faithful and true. Uh, St. Anthony was born up in a, about 251 uh, AD in uh, Egypt, not too far from Alexandria, uh, in, uh, in a uh, smaller village there. I forget the, the exact name of the village, but uh, he was born to Christian parents, noble, wealthy Christian parents. He had a terrific heritage uh, of faith, and that's why I say he was not uneducated because as a, as a person who was of wealthy and noble birth, he would have been educated in the basic kind of things of, uh, of the world. However, his parents died when he was about 20 years old. He had a younger sister also. Uh, but growing up, he uh, had desired simply to follow after God. And in these days, there were beginning to be a few people who were going out into the wilderness to live lives of contemplation and prayer, what we have come to call the monastic life. And, and the first of the so-called desert fathers were uh, beginning to be out there in the desert. And it was that kind of life that Anthony was really uh, wanting. After his parents died, uh, he was wealthy. Uh, you know, he had received a whole bunch of money and inheritance. And as his sister was younger, he did make, uh, spend a, some time taking care of her, watching over her, making sure that things were uh, taken care of with that. But one day, when he went into the church, he heard the gospel reading, which I'm sure you're familiar with, where Jesus says to the rich young man, if you would be perfect, go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. 20-year-old Anthony heard that in his heart as it's time, Anthony, for you to give away everything that you have and to the poor and go out and follow Christ in the wilderness. So he provided for his sister. He made sure that her inheritance was used to take care of her. But he gave the rest of his fortune away to the poor and then he went out into the desert, attached himself to an elder who was out there, a person who would, uh, had been praying out there for some time and who would teach him the ways. Well, uh, I don't want to get into all of the details of, uh, of his life over the next decades, and by decades I mean decades. Uh, he lived to be a very old man, 105 years old. Uh, he died in 355 during the episcopate of St. Athanasius in Alexandria, and um, according to Athanasius, he was still, you know, vibrant and healthy and strong, uh, even at the end there in his 90s and, and hundreds, <laughs> uh, so it's kind of a remarkable story, but during these many years out there in the wilderness, he spent a lot of time in, in prayer. Some 20 of it was actually spent in absolute solitude, where he was alone out there in the desert. His, his uh, spiritual father had given him a blessing to go and do what no one else had done, that is live as a hermit uh, and just pray. Anthony told stories of great spiritual battles that he would have in those times, uh, demons attacking him. Uh, temptations, thoughts, you know, all of the things that, that uh, one could uh, imagine. He sees all of those uh, difficulties, and yet, by the grace of God, he is able to uh, overcome 
these things. And after about 20 years, he's in his 40s, people began to come out there having heard of him and to want him to teach them. And so a whole community of people developed out in the desert around the place where Anthony, ironically, had gone to get away from everyone. And so eventually he left that spot and went even further into the desert so that he could have a place where he was uh, alone. That next place he went to actually was in a tomb. He lived in a, in a cave in a tomb uh, for a, a, a long time. But most of his life was spent in, in prayer. On two occasions, he actually did come into the city of Alexandria in 311, when he was about 60 years old of age. There was a, a persecution in Alexandria of Maximian. The emperor uh, was actively persecuting Christians, and Anthony came in to the city to give them comfort and strength with them. In fact, he kind of hoped, he said, that maybe he would be a martyr too. But no one uh, arrested him, or so he just spent his energies praying for people and being a, a support and a witness. And then later, when uh, Arius, the heretic, uh, arose in Alexandria, 318, three, you know, of course the Council of Nicaea, 325, and St. Athanasius became the bishop of uh, Alexandria, the word got around that uh, <coughs> Anthony was really an Arian. A Anthony was really supporting Arius. And Anthony wanted to dissuade that entirely, so he came into the city and with you know, went with Athanasius and proclaimed his, his support of Athanasius and the, and the Nicene Creed and the, the faith there and maintained his um, um, support all the way through all of Athanasius's, uh, well, the rest of Anthony's life, because An Athanasius lived 20 years beyond uh, Anthony. Athanasius actually was the one who wrote the biography of Anthony, the life of Anthony, and so uh, that's how we know most of these things. Now, his, his spiritual combat, so to speak, brought him great holiness. And I wanted to point to just a couple of things. There's 25 really detailed sayings of in the sayings of the Desert Fathers, but I've just selected a couple of sentences that I want to uh, focus our attention on. What was the, the chief thing that would get us through all of this struggle, according to Anthony? He says, I saw the snares that the enemy spreads out over the world, and I said, groaning, what can get through from such snares? And then I heard a voice saying to me, humility. So the first point I'd like to make with uh, Anthony's teaching is that humility is the centerpiece of everything. Uh, a lot of times we, we think that worldly position and worldly power uh, are going to be what gets us either respect or accomplishment, but Anthony says it isn't even knowledge like the great scholars he actually had several great scholars come out into the desert to talk to him because they were uh, you know they had heard that he was a person of great wisdom but they didn't believe that because he hadn't had an advanced education that he really knew much of anything and and he would comment to them and say say well you know which came first the book or the insight where does Knowledge, true knowledge come from and what does true knowledge consist of it, it, true knowledge for Anthony was really knowledge of God and so the, the uh, things that we could learn uh, you know, in the libraries and all of that might be useful but that is not going to be that which brings us salvation and all of those things that we hold to, the, the ideas of our own greatness, you know, if, if we don't put those aside, if we're proud and arrogant, then we're not going to find God. God is absolutely good and true and all-powerful, and it is in him that there is life, and in him that there is hope, and in him there is wisdom. And so humility is going to be that which gets us through. When the devil sets a trap for us, you know, of self-centeredness, self-interest, 
of anger, of frustration, of jealousy. All of those things are usually, uh, you know, part of our, our wounded pride, you know, the things that we think we deserve or we think we need to have. But, it's, but humility recognizes the grace and the power of God as ultimate, and that humility then will bring us through these temptations and, and snares. Anthony also believed that love of our neighbor was essential. So we start with humility, but then here's the sentence that I'll point to here. He says, our life and our death is with our neighbor. If we gain our brother, we have gained God. But if we scandalize our brother, we have sinned against Christ. Love of God, love of neighbor. That's what the scripture says is the centerpiece of, of, of the gospel. And uh, Anthony says that, that if our true life is in the way that we love other people. If we connect to other people with compassion, without judgment, if we pray for them, actively serve them, if we give them acts of mercy, if, if we love them in a word, then we are connecting to God because God is love. So that is a, Anthony one time had a vision. I don't know why he would ask this question, you know, but he did. He asked God after decades of, of prayer and spiritual growth, is there anyone my equal? And God showed him a vision of a man in Alexandria who was a doctor who was giving himself in service to other people day in and day out and day in and day out, uh, not asking for anything, just seeking the good of others. And God said to Anthony, there, Anthony, is your equal. You see, love of neighbor So humility and love of neighbor. The third thing is patience. Patience. It's going to take a long time for us to become righteous. I, it's amazing. He went out in the desert at 20, and he was still out there praying at 105. But he said this, the fruits of the earth are not brought to perfection immediately but by time, rain, and care. Similarly, the fruits of men ripen through ascetic practice, study, time, perseverance, self-control, and patience. Yeah. How are we going to become virtuous and righteous? You know, I don't know about the rest of you. I want a pill. <laughs> want something that I could do instantly, you know, mix it up and, and be right there with it. But this, the, the life in Christ is really not like that. The illustration is phenomenal. You know, you, you grow crops. Well, how, how do you grow crops? Well, you prepare the ground, you plant the seed, you wait for them to germinate and grow. There has to be rain, water, light. There has to be maybe even fertilizer, things that you put in there to help Make it, uh, make it grow, and you have to wait. Plant the, plant the crop in the spring, and then in the late summer, or early fall, you harvest it. It just takes time. Uh, you know, we had pear trees in our yard in Indiana, and it was about 120 days from the time that we saw the first flowers till the time that the pears would be showing up there and ready to pick off the tree. We ultimately have way too many pears, but point was, I might want those pears quickly, but I can't get them quickly. They, they come when they're ripened. The same thing's true with our, our virtues. We uh, have to cultivate our spirit through ascetic practice, fasting, prayer, almsgiving, through uh, self-control, through patience, through perseverance, enduring the things that come to us. And over time, those things produce in us virtue. Now it isn't just by accident either. 
Anthony in another passage says that uh, if a person uh, is trying to make uh, a sword or an axe or a scythe, then he has to, if he's going to forge something like that, he has to know what he's making or he's not going to make it. You know, it's not going to end up being. He said it's like that with virtue. If you're wanting to cultivate a virtue, you need to know what you're trying to cultivate. Are you trying to build love? Well, then certain acts build love. Are you trying to build patience? Certain things build patience. Are you trying to get self-control? These things build self-control. If you see what I see what I mean, and all that's going to take time and take endurance. It's going to. We're going to have to wrestle through things. There's no such thing as a quick spirituality. A quick spirituality is not true spirituality. It's counterfeit. That which is truly of God bears fruit, just like the natural world bears fruit. One last quote that I've been thinking about a lot for the last oh, few months, really. Uh, it gets spread around on the internet a little bit these days, I think because it's so poignant. St. Anthony says, a time is coming when men will go mad. And when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him, saying, you are mad. You are not like us. And I wonder sometimes whether or not we have come to the time that Anthony proposed, you know, when, when people in our culture and the world as a whole are embracing the, the madness of postmodern philosophic relativism. Look, looking at things that are that are uh, evil and calling them good. They are looking at things that are transitory and saying that is what life is really about. They're looking at moral principles and saying none of those things hold and traditional viewpoints don't hold and even reality is a, is a socially constructed, intellectually constructed reality. And, and af after a while, you know, that just becomes And when we, as, as Christians, assert that there actually is a God, that there actually is something that is real and good and true, that truth and beauty and goodness are objective and that can actually be uh, you know, seen and, and noted, then people look at us and say, you're just, you're just mad. You're, you're not like us. So that Anthony's statement comes with a bit of a warning, you know, that we ought to be grounded in the reality, grounded in the, the truth, and, and then even if the world around us is going mad, find ourselves still grounded in God, in Christ. That is why Anthony went from Alexandria out into the desert, because he wanted to be grounded in the one true reality, which was God himself. And he found him found peace, and he found love, and he found wisdom, and he found spiritual power, and he found righteousness. Most importantly, all of that is summed up in he found Christ. So that is what the call for us is to do, to, to find Christ. He may not call us like he did Anthony into the desert. Each of us have our own calling and, and uh, ministry that God wants us to work on out and do. But over time, God's intention for every one of us is to make us holy and righteous, to make us reflections of his glory, to make us to understand his wisdom and truth and to know him and to know the power of his resurrection and to live righteousness. Anthony is a phenomenal example of that single-hearted devotion and commitment to Christ. And his wisdom resounds throughout the life of the church and can provide us with, with a vision as to what we ought to be in a world that increasingly
holding 